We have a different kind of podcast for you today, or at least a different kind of guest. We are fortunate enough to have with us Jeffrey Seller. Jeffrey is the producer most recently and currently of Hamilton, which is the biggest Broadway sensation and hit and innovation that um, I've ever seen and that I think that street and the theater world has ever seen. Uh, and he has also uh, a tremendous amount of work before Hamilton. He was also behind Rent, which was at that time exactly what Hamilton is at this time. It was groundbreaking. It was shifting what Broadway was doing at the time. He is, in effect, CEO of Hamilton Inc. right now, and he has been the producer of, of these other shows. And so we're lucky enough to have him with us today to talk about leadership and, and what it takes to lead in the world that he's leading in. Jeffrey, welcome to the Bregman Leadership Podcast. Good afternoon, Peter. It's good to be here. Thank you. I should also, in full disclosure, say that Jeffrey's a friend of mine. And so, uh, you know, I think very positively of him, whether it's professionally or personally as well. That always makes a difference. Um, Jeffrey, uh, let's start with um, Hamilton and the massive success that it's been. The first question is, did you imagine that? I mean, Lin-Manuel was already getting some press before, before you guys went live. Did you imagine that it would have the impact that it's having? No. Um, I knew what Lynn was writing was special. I knew it was exemplary. Um, and I thought that it would achieve success. I didn't know exactly what kind of success, but I thought this will be a successful show. And whether or not this ultimately becomes a show that is for everybody, I don't know. Uh, the lyrics are very dense. The subject matter is unexpected. Um, and, uh, so I knew what he was doing was special, but I just predicted it would be some sort of a success. And maybe that would have been the kind of success that runs on Broadway for a season. Um, you know, we had a musical called fun home on Broadway last year. It was a critical success. Uh, it recouped its investment. It won the Tony for Best Musical, and it closed in less than two years. But it was a success. So I didn't know what kind of Hamilton, what kind of success Hamilton would be. Um, and I have been as uh, um, flabbergasted as anybody by the um, uh, level of success that Hamilton has achieved. So I'm curious now from a behavioral standpoint, an emotional standpoint, right? Because you've just described two shows, both of which are great. I didn't, I didn't see the fun house you said. It's, it was called fun home, fun home. So yeah. sorry. And I didn't see fun home, but it's, but it was clearly a success and it won best musical. And yet it didn't, it didn't have, you know, it didn't last for, for years and years and years. And it didn't have right. the kind of success of Hamilton. Um, how do you manage yourself as a leader in, you know, your care about each of these shows? It's great. You know, from a business perspective, you've already described it. It recouped its investment. It was, it was profitable. But, you know, how do you handle the divergence of two successes even? And, and I'm sure there's some which haven't been successful in the way that you've expected. But I, I, I imagine the emotional toll that that takes may be high. How do you manage yourself in the context of that? Um, success feels good. And um, success is in its own way easy. It's easy on your kishkas. It's easy uh, um, on my stomach and on my heart. Um, it is also true that failure, the, the feelings that failure evokes are so much worse than the positive feelings that success evokes. And, um, and I guess, you know, I've heard that I've heard of tennis players who say, I never feel as good winning as badly I feel when I'm losing. And so how do you, cause, cause you, cause here's the thing in, in given that, 
I would imagine that it might lead somebody to take fewer risks, not more, right? Because Oh, the, I think so. And the aversion, and we know this financially too, of loss aversion is much stronger than, you know, yeah. the longing for gain. And yet, you just described this huge risk you took with Hamilton, which is the subject matter was dense, the language was difficult. You, you know, there's at least eight different uh, uh, song or, or, or music technologies in this, you know, like that, you know, yeah. I don't know if music technology is the right word, but you're going from like jazz to rap to Broadway to, um, you, you've taken huge risks and, and you've done it before. So how do you keep yourself taking these risks when you know so deeply the pain of that kind of failure? Um, I guess it's because it's the only thing I know how to do. And, um, and, and, and maybe that's not fully true, but I consider myself a student of the American musical theater. No more, no less. Um, I'm still learning. I am still curious about what makes a musical um, affecting, what makes a musical successful, what makes a musical fail. And, um, and for those reasons, I keep... I only know how to start making another musical. And at the same time that I'm saying that, there was a moment maybe with regard to Hamilton where I said to myself, wow, I'm about to have my call it seventh or eighth opening night on Broadway, where on the day of the opening, I can't eat. And I can't eat because I am so twisted up inside about what the reviews are going to be when they come out at 10.04 tonight. And I say to myself, how can I be doing this again? <laughs> it feels so awful waiting for those reviews, those reviews that will have a strong impact on the success or failure of my show. And, um, and all I can say is the first one feels awful waiting and the eighth one feels awful waiting and it doesn't get better and it doesn't get worse. It's just always difficult. And, um, and then I just realized, well, this is my job. <laughs> you know, and, and it's, I have two thoughts about that. One is the way you framed it, right? Which is that you're a student and you're curious about, about musical theater. And so you're not, it, it feels to me like you're not, after it in order to chase the success. You certainly want the success. You certainly don't want the failure. But you're you're in it for something deeper than the success or the failure. And you can't achieve that deeper thing without weathering successes and failures. But you're not pursuing the success or the failure ultimately. Is, am I thinking about this correctly? You were thinking about this beautifully because the truth of it is, is that there is no path to success. Right. And, and that's, that's the, maybe that's the stupidest thing I could ever say. But what I'm saying is that um, there is no book that will tell me or you or anybody else who's interested how to make a successful musical. It doesn't exist. And um, all I can try to do is please myself. I want to make a musical. I want to produce a musical that is satisfying to me. I wanna produce a musical that will surprise me, that will um, affect me emotionally, that will evoke an um, emotional response uh, from my insides, that will make the hair on my arms stand up. And all I'm in pursuit of is that. And then I hope that if the musical is evoking those feelings from me, Hopefully, it will evoke those feelings from an audience. I love it. And I don't think it's, it's silly to say. I actually think it's profound. And I think it's, it's something that, you know, the millions, the hundreds of millions of business books that are out there that are all saying the opposite, which is, here's your path to success. And then people read them and you wonder, like, why aren't all these businesses successful, <laughs> right? right? Because if there were that really clear path, I've often thought about this. One of my clients was the uh, CEO of a licensing company. So what they do is they find licenses. They, they owned the um, or had the license for Snoopy, right? They, they own licenses 
and and they're the game that they're in and what they're experts in is finding licenses that they're going to be able to make money from in effect that's the game that they're in that's their financial model and i said to the ceo can you tell me is there like how you figure it out like how do you know if something's going to be big or not big and that's when he introduced me to the book um fooled by randomness and he said mm. it is it is throwing spaghetti on a wall and seeing what sticks like we are in the business of doing this and i can tell you we don't know how to do it any better than anybody else that you know it's it's and it's exactly what you're saying which is you you follow your gut and your instinct and what you know to the best that that you can um, uh, you, yeah. you're also reminding me that 20 years ago shortly after i produced rent a lot of broadway producers were using these focus groups to try to find out how to better advertise and market their shows i didn't believe in it but my advertising agency persuaded me to try one we went to chicago they got one of those groups of eight, nine, ten women, because women buy the tickets to Broadway. And what we're going to try to find out is how much do they know about rent? The shows, by the way, it's been on Broadway for a year. How much do they know about rent? What do they feel about rent? And what is it going to take to get them to buy a ticket to rent? And, um, uh, and of course, I'm in the back room where you can watch through the windows. These women go. And I proceeded to watch, first of all, few of the women even know what it was. Then um, they were asked, like, what shows were playing in Chicago? And one of them could only come up with, uh, there's a musical, I think it's called Colors. And what she was referring to was Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat. That's all she could say. There's a musical, I think it's called Colors. And, um, and then they're going on about what would make them buy or not, not buy a ticket. And I'm watching as one person talks, the other people start to echo what that first person said. And I said, I will never do this again. This is the stupidest exercise ever imagined. Because here's the other truth. Even those ladies, they don't know what they want. And to ask them what they hypothetically might buy a ticket to is total bullshit right. because the only truth is did they buy a ticket or didn't they? Right. People cannot be trusted to say I might buy a ticket. That means nothing. Right. There's also a tremendous amount of, of, of research that says if one person says something in a focus group, everybody else is going to start to echo that even if they disagree because that's the social contagion of uh, like what people say. I saw it play out. I don't feel like a genius, but it was patently, patently obvious to me. Yes. Yeah, it, it's it's um, it's so interesting. So it, it, it what you're saying, which I think is important, you know, it's for for me as a writer, it's really important too. Which is to say, you know, we're it's not that we're not doing art for an audience. But we're not asking the audience what kind of art we should do for them. 100%. Right. They don't know. Um, I have to make art that pleases me. And, you're... and I have to believe that when uh, Pollock and Rothko were making art, they were only making art that would please them. And you're willing to weather either success or failure in order to explore and examine and play with art that excites you. That's, you know, all I can hope is that the art that excites me will line up with public taste at that period in time. Right. And now, I have been fortunate because the slightly offbeat musicals that I have liked Rent, Avenue Q, Hamilton have aligned with the public. So I want to explore that a little bit because you're, you managed to walk an edge. And the edge that you're walking is you're, you're not doing what everybody else is doing. And yet you're not so out there that people can't absorb it. It's like this, it's like you're, this knife edge of saying, I'm going to push the envelope, but not so far that it gets rejected. 
and at the same time far enough that, that it's exciting. And I imagine for you as a professional, your tolerance for what you're willing to look at and experience and see is it goes far beyond because you're, you know, you're in the field goes far beyond what the millions of people who want to see the show is. So you're not going up to your edge necessarily, but you're going up to an edge because everything, you know, the, the three shows that you represented, you know, that you, um, produce that you created Avenue Q rent and, and ha- Hamilton are, um, you know, really walk that edge. I mean, they did something different than anybody else was doing on Broadway. How, how are you finding, and it might be the same answer, which is I'm kind of feeling it out here, but, but how are you managing, I mean, do you think of it in the way that I'm saying? And, and if so, how do, you, how do you stay on it without falling off one side or the other? Well, the first answer is that that wasn't my intention. I didn't set out to say, I want to be a Broadway producer and I'm going to look to live on the edge. I'm going to look to produce shows that um, are unconventional, that are iconoclastic, that push the envelope and hope that the audience is there to receive them. That's that it's just, I, I was just, I'm going to produce musicals that I like. That's where we start. Okay. Now let's go back to Rent because it all starts there, which is that uh, when I'm working on Rent, I'm 28, 29, you know, I'm 29, 30 years old. And what the genius creator of Rent, Jonathan Larson, um, was doing was writing a musical about his friends, young bohemians, 20 somethings living in the East Village in New York, um, pursuing their artistic dreams while not selling out trying to find love and friendship and camaraderie um, in a world that feels like it's, you know, ripping apart at the seams. Right. He was writing my story. It wasn't exactly my story, but um, certainly, uh, you know, writing about people who often are on the fringe, whether they're lesbians, gay men, drug addicts, people living with HIV. Um, some of that applied to me, some of it didn't. But what was absolutely essential was that he was writing in a musical vernacular that was not represented on Broadway at that time and that moved me. So the way in which the characters of Mimi and Roger meet each other and start to fall for each other with the song Light My Candle was a sound I'd never heard on Broadway before. And it touched me and it made me feel in a whole different way. Um, And that's what I realized is what I love, the value that I have for what kind of musical I want to see. So it turns out that we were doing a musical that dealt with heroin addiction, HIV, gay guys, lesbian women, uh, people who are bohemians living on the fringe, homeless people were in it, Um, all of which seems very un-Broadway material, but it was being wrapped in some of the most glorious melodies that were um, accessible to many, many people. Mm -hmm. And the theme song of the show is a beautiful gospel song called Seasons of Love, you know, uh, 525,600 minutes. Which is the theme song of... Uh, or, or at least I've heard it sung in in some ways as a theme song of a camp that my kids go to. Oh, it's been a theme song of camps, <laughs> weddings, bar mitzvahs, funerals. I mean, you know, it became a it became an anthem. Right, right. So he, Jonathan, was able to deliver something that was both radical and completely humanizing and embracing at the same time. You know, it brings me to this idea that I'm struggling with in the book that I'm writing right now and that um, that feels so true because you keep bringing the conversation back to feeling. And mm. and and uh, I was in this conversation, believe it or not, with someone yesterday about the meaning of life, right? We, uh, don't hate me, but we were in this conversation about the meaning of life and we were reading this, this Jewish text um, – uh, Ecclesiastes, the Ecclesiastes, the Kohelet is what it's called. But, but we're reading it and we're talking about it. And it's very depressing in many ways. And the person saying, you know, I try everything and nothing, everything's like spitting in the wind. Like, not, you know, it's like, and we were talking about it. I'm sorry. 
And yeah, and I said, I, and so the, my friend who I was talking with said to me, you know, what do you think the meaning of life is? And I said, and I was drinking tea at the time. I was drinking like a warm rose hip tea. And I said, I don't know what the meaning of life is, but this tea tastes really good. <laughs> and and it, it brings me to that too. It's like, I don't necessarily know what the meaning of life is, but it feels really great to hear that song. And I would love to spread that song out to more people. And, and that's, I mean, it's just bringing me back to this conversation because we could argue forever about what the meaning of life is, but, but you know, that was a great show. <laughs> well, life seems to, what I think what you're saying is, is that life is the sum of all of our feelings. Because you, the rose hip tea made you feel good. You're, it touched your senses, your sense of taste, your sense of smell, and your sense of touch. Yeah, and I absolutely. That's absolutely right. And it brought me back to a place also. It brought me back to when I was in college and I would right. sit and sip tea. And, and well, it, this also reminds me, Peter, of the fact that um, when we met um, at our children's summer camp, uh, you visiting your daughter, uh, me and my partner visiting our son, and we had our first conversation, you uh, posited a hypothesis that I am that I have been talking about to this day. And if I and I'm going to paraphrase it, and you'll tell me if I got it right, which is that if you're willing to feel everything, you can do anything. Exactly. That was exactly right. I love it. And I believe it to be true. And I do believe, and, and how I perceive it is that if I'm willing to express my feelings, to say what's on my mind, to deal with everybody in my world as honestly as is practicable or practicable, um, then I might be able to do any, you know, to do what I want to, you know, to, to, um, you, I can do anything. Right. And, um, I think that to be true, and I think that, I don't know where are we going. I think that we're going is that I am driven by feeling. I am, a, I am an entrepreneur, I am a businessman, I am the quote unquote CEO of Hamilton, and yet I am driven first and foremost by my feelings. And it served you very well. And it has served me well, absolutely, yeah. Um, Joyfully, yeah. joyously. And, and uh and I think you, I mean, as I listen to you, I think you can't do what you've done. You can't lead on that knife's edge, right? You can't lead in a way where you're doing cutting edge work, where you're doing something really worth bringing into the world without feeling a whole lot. <laughs> like, so if you don't yes. like feeling, you're not going to be able to lead in that way. If you're not willing to feel, you're not going to be able to lead in that way. Then go be an accountant. Right. Not that there's anything wrong with accountants, but that's no, the but, right but, job. But, but for people that do not have the tolerance, right? It's tolerance, and the tolerance is for anxiety, fear, bewilderment, and pain, right? And and maybe even enjoying all of that. Meaning, I think there's something about pain of loss if you are really willing to feel it. That's part of the whole picture, right? That's that's like it's not something you want. I, I, I'll tell you, I just remember, I remember um, my, uh, Isabel, my oldest daughter, she was, this was, she was our first child, she was still our first child, but at the time she was our only child, and she, um, it was like three in the morning, and she was sick, and she vomited, you know, all over her bed, and I was up cleaning it up, and but I remember thinking like, on the one level, this is like disgusting and the smell is disgusting and it makes me want to vomit also. But on, the, on another level, like there's something really special about this moment I'm never going to forget. It's yeah. like this is being a parent. Yes. And, and I think there's some element of going, I love this too. Like even though I wouldn't ask for it or plan it in my day or put my alarm to wake up at three to do it, I'm kind of happy I'm in it. Because it's, it's how we know we're alive. It's how we know we're alive. Yeah. Let me ask you, let me switch gears here a little bit and ask you a, a, a sort of business leadership question, right? You're CEO of Hamilton. You've got a Please. whole bunch of people who work um, with you, for you, who are putting on this show. Uh, I, I imagine sometimes they could be dramatic because they're, you know, this is the industry that they've chosen that they're in. And 
And you manage not only to find really amazing talent, but to bring out that talent. I mean, that's what your job is to very specifically, what most leaders are trying to do is to not be the smartest or most capable person in the room for everything, right? You need someone who sings better than you. You need someone who dances better than you. You need someone who, you know, has a certain kind of charm or finesse or presence. And, and, and you also have to manage them to bring out that best part. This is a massively big question. Anything you can share with us about how to do that or, or lessons that you've learned in doing that because you know every leader who has employees faces the same challenge. It's in a different level and in a different way, but faces that same challenge. How do I find the people who are most talented around me and how do I bring out the, the best of who they are? Um, I think that I have been um, playing, uh, uh, this may sound like a pejorative, but I think that there's been, I've had a Tom Sawyer quality of getting the kids together to paint the fence my whole life. And if I could qualify it in one way, I would say, and it wasn't so that they would paint the fence and I would go off and um, swim in the river. It was that I'm always assembling people so we can do something together, so that we can make something great together. And um, for me, it starts literally with being in the fifth grade. And uh, in this community I grew up in, Oak Park, Michigan, which is a small suburb just north of Detroit, um, they instituted for the very first time in, when I was in fifth grade this, this notion of a February winter break where you get a week off in February. I, I think the idea had something to do with families being able to go to Florida. No one in my neighborhood could afford to go to Florida. Like there wasn't one family going to Florida. <laughs> and uh, we were trying to raise money for a, a June trip to go to Ann Arbor and visit the University of Michigan. And I said to myself, what if we created a winter camp? And I got my five best friends together and uh, we made a flyer to distribute to all of the kindergartners and first graders. And here was the deal. Five days of winter camp, like four hours a day, we were going to use my best friend's next door neighbor's garage. They were the only family that had a garage. It was not heated. Um, and uh, it was a 25 cents a day. But if you bought all five days, it was a buck. <laughs> and my memory, uh, which uh, I remember distinctly, was that and we made 20 bucks. We got 20 kids to participate in this winter camp. So here I was getting all of these people together toward this common mission, which is we're going to make 20 bucks and we'll put that toward the 120 bucks we need to make by June to get a really nice bus to take us all from Oak Park to Ann Arbor, Michigan. And this story starts there and then it goes all the way to me being a student at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor, Michigan huh. wow. and directing Greece. Right. For the soft show, you know, so, Grease the Musical. So those were the first tickets that you ever sold? Correct. And they didn't have to go, they didn't end up on StubHub. They were full-on direct tickets. They were full-on 25 cents. 25 and, cents. Um, and uh, I'm 10 years old. Right. And, I'm take, and I'm getting parents to let me take care of their five- and six-year-old children. Right. Um, so... I've always had an idea, let's do something, and then I'm recruiting people to do it with. And as I have um, progressed through my life, um, I have been blessed to find great, uh, um, creative, ingenious people with whom to do it. You know, I often um, um, give advice to young people who want to be in the theater, and I say, it's all about who you team up with. Mm -hmm. Um, and when I was in my mid twenties, I teamed up with Jonathan Larson, the car, the artist who ultimately went on to write rent because I believed in his work because his work elicited so much feeling from me. Mm -hmm. Um, I believed in Andrew Lippa, the composer of big fish and, um, uh, Harvey milk, uh, the oratorio, um, and the wild party and the Adams family. And, um, and he is a successful Broadway composer. So these are the mates 
that I chose to work with in my 20s. And, um, and that's what got me to where I am. So part of it is like just the talent of who do you choose? Right. Who do you want to be in the room with? And then once we're in the room, is it possible that the chemistry will create a whole that is greater than the sum of its parts? How did you know that you, the role you wanted to play in that room was was CEO, was producer, was the guy yeah. pulling it together. Yeah, I, I want to qualify the CEO phrase because, A, <laughs> I am technically, we do not have a CEO of uh, Hamilton. Uh, yeah, I'm I glad am, you're clarifying that. I realize yeah, I'm I, using it a little yeah. loosely. Yeah, no, but I, I, I want to qualify it by saying, A, you know, well, what we use is the term general partner. Um, and, um, and the CEO term is actually has its own good um, quality because over the course of my career, people have often said, well, what does the producer do? And sometimes I would say, it's kind of like being the CEO. And sometimes I would make comparisons to, for example, Danny Meyer, the owner of Union Square Cafe and all those great restaurants in which Danny is an entrepreneur. Um, he is a businessman. He is a restaurateur. Um, he puts all these amazing restaurants together, but in fact, he's not a chef and he has a chef in each one. So sometimes I would, I would compare myself to him. And then, uh, when the New York times did this, uh, profile of me this past April, I, I don't remember how they got that headline, but they said the CEO of Hamilton and it stuck obviously cause it was a great, um, uh, uh, you know, mirror Sorry, of, Alexander Hamilton, the man right. and the idea of money and business and art. So it, it stuck for all of those reasons and it has great applicability. But having said that, so I, I'm the general partner of Hamilton, but I'm not the CEO. And now I've completely forgotten the question. <laughs> <laughs> the, I may have forgotten the question also. Um, no, I remember the question. It's, it's, um, the role, like, how did you know that this is the role that you oh, wanted to play in, life. in theory? Yeah, I was, I think I'm a born leader. No, I know I'm a born leader. I was the kid who was always taking over, for better or for worse. Right. And it meant that I was freshman class president in ninth grade, and then they threw me out because I was so dictatorial in 10th grade. <laughs> and, um, and then it meant that I became the editor-in-chief of the yearbook because um, when I learned that the yearbook editor um, does not have to operate under the rules of democracy, but the editor gets to actually make unilateral decisions, I thought that is the job for me. Um, uh, so, and, you, so I think something important here is that you, you know, you you like to step into control and and leadership, and you're also not bashful about it. Meaning you're not you're not trying to. I mean, what I'm hearing from you saying is you're embracing the way in which you lead. Obviously, you lead in a way that brings other people in because otherwise you wouldn't have great talent around you. Yeah. But but you're also not bashful about having an opinion and saying, I'm not going to do a focus group. Those are stupid. I know what I think. I know what I feel. Yeah, like, I'm all of 33, by the way, telling them their focus groups are stupid. By the way, I'm now 52 and I think I was right. I think you um, were right. I think you were right. And by the way, the research supports that you were right. But yeah. the point is you're not afraid at 33 to say, and maybe we're more afraid at 52 than we are at 33. There's a lot of things I said at 20 that, that, you know, I might hedge a little bit now and at, at 48, well, now we, but well, now we know how much we don't know. Right, right. There's a great bumper sticker I saw once hire a teenager while he still knows everything. Correct. Right. That's great. Um, I think that, uh, to get back to some of, you know, the qualities that you explore in your business and in these podcasts to leadership, I believe it's, I think it's a trait. I think it's in our DNA. I think some people have it and express it. And I think some people don't have it and don't have any need to express it. And, uh, it's, uh, and you know, I think we could ask all kinds of Freudian questions about, you know, what was it about my early childhood that made me feel like I needed to be in control? But yes, I have to tell you, I was basically um, at a very young age, the leader of my house with two parents, you know, who were suddenly, uh, you know, putting me in charge. Not that it was a good thing to do, but there was a quality of leadership with me that, you know, I was constantly taking charge of every environment I was in. And if I couldn't take charge, I often would get rid of it. Right. <laughs> And, and you also, you know, I know from that I was, I, I, Just to give you one more yeah. example, sorry to interrupt. No. I was on the board, a board of a not-for-profit recently, and uh, I couldn't bear it. <laughs> so I was like, I'm not in charge. Yeah, I wanted to like, I wanted to say, let the president be in charge. And if they screw up, we'll get rid of them. 
but I don't have any desire to be in this room anymore. And I had to get off. I was like, cause I'm not in charge. So I don't want to do it. If you want me to be in charge, I'll do the job. If you don't goodbye, I'm going running. I, I, I mean, I share, I, I share that experience on boards and that, and that frustration. Like it's, you know, you have to sort of sit on your hands a little bit if you're going to, if you're going to bear with it. You also have a tremendous amount of, um, confidence in your work and and I and and the way I'm thinking about this and it, this feels important to me and and I I saw it I know it's public so I could share it because it was in the New York Times article but you're investing in your own shows you're not um, you're 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 putting your money in the work that you're doing and 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 so there's a level of risk to your commitment that you and 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 a risk that pays off well but it's a risk to your commitment that says I'm I'm committed. I I'm not doing this just to succeed. I'm doing it because this makes me feel something, and I absolutely want to succeed. But it may fail because I'm not just doing what everybody else is doing, and I'm personally at risk. And that there's something about that that feels important. Does it feel important to you? I mean, is it just a financial decision for you, or is something else going on with that? Uh, I'm thinking back again to Rent, our first show, my first show. Um, at the time that I was developing rent with my then business partner, Kevin, um, we owned a booking agency and, um, we were vendors for Broadway producers. My job was to book the national tour of crazy for you. I was the middleman between the producer in New York and the presenter in Cleveland. Mm -hmm. Uh, and it was a good job and we would get a weekly fee and I made a pretty good living. I was by no means, I wasn't even close to rich. I was just making a good living. But our agency was becoming profitable and had, you know, tens of thousands of dollars, not hundreds of thousands of dollars of, um, of um, free cash. And um, so when Kevin and I decided to do rent, we knew we needed to get some investors. So we got one big investor who could take a big share. And then, so we're now, we're in 1995 and, and, and Kevin and I, and we need to put up uh, between me and Kevin and then this one big financial investor we get who's a finance guy, we have to put up basically $150,000. And uh, he's going to put up half. And then Kevin and I have to put up 75, 37, five each. And we just took the money out of our booking agency. And we didn't get any more investors. We just did it. And I don't remember being overly, uh, it was like, well, it was just booking money. Right. And, uh, you know, I didn't have uh, uh, a relationship. I didn't have children. I didn't have any responsibilities. And I knew I could, you know, pay for my rent. So we just did it. So in our very first show, uh, against the absolute advice of our lawyer, who said you should absolutely, A, not put up this much money, and B, you shouldn't put up any of your own money, we each put in the equivalent of 37.5 each. And I've never looked back. Um, and of course, part of that is because of the fortunate financial windfall that rent caused that gave me the confidence to say, I can keep doing musicals I want to do, and I never have to do something I don't want to do. That feels and I've been burned deeply. Burned because... I've lost a lot of money. Right. Because the shows didn't do the way you were expecting. Because I put too much money in a show right. and it didn't make money and it right. lost money. So right. I, I lost a lot of money. Right. And and yet you continue to do it because on thankfully, right? Because well, the on, other thing I also whole. believe is that A, we must not cherry pick because it will never get it right. Mm -hmm. And if I lose money in one show and then say, oh, I better not do it in the next I'm going to be in big trouble if the next one's the hit. I have to, I, I'll give you an example. I, I was doing this, um, I did an opera on Broadway in 2002. We did La Boheme on Broadway in Italian, and it was a beautiful production conceived and directed by the filmmaker Baz Luhrmann. And I had persuaded this group of Korean investors who I had done some other business with to invest a whopping million dollars. They lose 900 of the million. Uh, I asked them to invest in this little show with puppets called Avenue Q. They pass. Avenue Q goes on to make over $30 million of profit for all of its investors. They cherry picked. 
Right. And they used the fear that losing money in La Boheme generated to guide their next decision. Right. And the answer is you find really good people who are talented, who are doing work they consider to be important, whose heart and soul is in that work. And, and you go for a ride with them. You got to bet on the people. We'll right. never know if, what the show is going to be. Right. Jeffrey, thank you so much. The Jeffrey Seller, he is the uh, general partner of Hamilton and a number of other really amazing shows. And, and you show true leadership in the work that you do. And they're good lessons for me as I think about the work that I do also. And, and you know, some of the uh, struggles I have in writing my next book, you're, you're helping me to frame them. So, uh, Jeffrey, thank you so much for being on the Bregman Leadership Podcast. It's a delight. Thank you, Peter.